the last stage of Washington's presidency that we're going to address is, as you can see at the top, foreign relations, how we deal with other countries. And the primary countries we're going to deal with are France, Great Britain, Spain, and even though it might not seem foreign, Native American tribes were considered to be sovereign, separate territories that existed within the U.S. So we start with our good friends, the French. Now, within the context of dealing with France, remember that France officially had been American allies since February of 1778 when Benjamin Franklin convinced them to sign a pair of treaties with us. It granted French goods what are called most favored nation status in the U.S., meaning we trade with them. And it also committed the French to a military alliance with the United States. And by the wording of this alliance, France was supposed to assist us in winning the American Revolution, which we see here helped the U.S. during the Revolutionary War. On the flip side, the United States, given how much closer we were to the Caribbean than France was, we were supposed to reciprocate by helping to protect the French possessions in the West Indies. Very lucrative possessions, meaning they made a lot of money. Now, in reality, we know that France basically just wanted to defeat Britain rather than necessarily help us, but uh, in this particular instance, the end justified the means. We fast forward now about a decade later, 1789, and when you look at what's called the French Revolution, I mean, they were inspired by us. The French people, many aristocrats, were inspired by what happened in the United States, but to make a long story short, theirs was a little bloodier than ours. All right, as Washington assumes the presidency, the Bastille, a French prison that symbolized the monarchy and oppression, it fell, and the French Revolution began. Now, Thomas Jefferson was in France when it all began, and him and his followers viewed it simply as an extension of the American Revolution. And he even helped draft a document. He helped the Marquis de Lafayette write what was called a Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Now, France's revolution got completely out of control. And we can see here, king and queen beheaded. King Louis the 16th and his wife, Marie Antoinette, were executed. And France ended up declaring war against Great Britain because Great Britain wasn't going to let the actions of France stand. Now, Washington understands that we can't afford to get involved because we're too young of a nation. And Britain is one of our biggest trading partners, so it goes back to the money yet again. We didn't want to antagonize them, and he didn't agree with all of the violence that was occurring. What ends up occurring is he orders a proclamation of neutrality. Neutrality. That's where we see we are friendly and impartial, and we stay neutral. He uses the logic of his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, that we signed a defensive treaty with the French monarchy. We entered a deal with the French king. France had declared themselves a republic, a different government. Therefore, we didn't have to abide by that particular agreement. That's the logic of what he uses to get around it. Now, Republicans thought that this was a betrayal of our alliance. And they were upset that this was an executive proclamation. And they thought that if Congress had the power to declare war, they should be the ones to declare neutrality. This is going to lead to the formation of what are called democratic Republican societies. And it gives American politics more of a, a raucous feel. 
So instead of politely discussing politics in parlors and taverns, which had happened before, now we're going to see mobs of people voice their opinions in the streets. So when it came to our relationship with France, rocky, rocky to say the least. Then there's the British. The British are, well, they're up to their old tricks is the best way we can put it. The war has ended. We won. But they are still operating forts in the Northwest Territory. So that territory that's north of the Ohio River, east of the Mississippi River, what's now the upper Midwest and Wisconsin's part of it, Britain has failed to vacate their forts, which is illegal. Britain is also intercepting U.S. ships and impressing sailors into their navy. There is a fear, and to a large extent this was a reality, that British sailors were literally jumping ship. They were getting hired by American merchant marine vessels who needed men because the, these British soldiers wanted to avoid war. So British press gangs were requesting and in some cases forcing the issue of boarding U.S. ships to look for British soldiers. And then finally, Britain was provoking frontier attacks by inciting and arming Native American tribes. And when you look at it from the Native perspective, it made sense. You have the United States who is pressing further west onto their land. You have the British who are saying, we'll arm you, we'll help you out. It made total sense. Now, John Jay is still Chief Justice of the United States when he was sent to London to negotiate a solution to all of these issues. So that tells you how little the Supreme Court had to do in those early years, that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court went over to London, negotiated a treaty, and came back. And he was actually elected governor of New York while he was in London. So he resigned as Chief Justice shortly after he returned. Now, by the terms of this treaty, Jay's Treaty, the British were supposed to give up their forts in the Northwest Territory. They agreed to it. So this should have taken care of number one. It, it doesn't. They're still going to be there, but that was theoretically what would occur. The concept of neutral seas was supposed to be the focus of number two. No more impressing sailors, no more seizing U.S. ships didn't really happen. Now, this concept of setting up 10 years of trade and most favored nation status. Most favored nation status means that each nation gives the other the best available deal on trade goods to maximize profit. Now, in this case, the status only applies to British imports meaning it will only apply to British goods coming in to the United States, not the other way around. It doesn't apply to American goods going to Britain. And Southerners are upset that Jay failed to negotiate compensation for escaped American slaves during the revolution. But at this point, what really counts is that war would be avoided with England. Is it unpopular in the short term? 100%. John Jay declared that he had been burned in effigy, meaning people created dolls that looked like him and burned them. He claimed that he had been burned in effigy in so many towns that he could sail the eastern seaboard at night by the light of those effigies. This was very unpopular in the short term, but long term, yes. It is what we needed at the time. So for the time being, this settles some issues with Great Britain. Now we say internal relations because even though we're dealing with Spain, we can see that it's Spain to the west and the United States to the east. Now the success of Jay's treaty will allow for the negotiation of what's called Pinckney's Treaty with Spain. 
following the revolution, we were supposed to be able to use the Mississippi River, but Spain had restricted U.S. shipping. I mean, we were supposed to use the Mississippi River, granted the right to use New Orleans. Spain was not allowing it to happen. Now, there were efforts, and John Jay, the guy who did Jay's treaty with England, John Jay had tried to negotiate a new treaty under the Articles of Confederation, but it failed miserably. Now it succeeds. So the United States could not only freely use the all-important Mississippi River and the important port of New Orleans, because at this time, if you are a farmer, you need the Mississippi River and you need New Orleans to ship your goods to market. If you want your goods to go east, you need to use this river and this port. This not only allows us to use it, but it firmly establishes the Mississippi River as our western boundary. So we, we deal with Spain in this regard. When we look internally, we also have to address internal relations with Native Americans. Now, back all the way back in 1789, George Washington, President Washington, tells the first governor of the Northwest Territory that he preferred to negotiate rather than go to war with hostile tribes in the region. On the same token, he was not afraid to use force against tribes he viewed as aggressive and threatened American settlements. Now, as we've seen, often these tribes are kind of being egged on by the British. Now, in 1789, Washington did address chiefs of the Seneca tribe, and he verbally condemned the actions of settlers who killed Native Americans. You know, Henry Knox, Secretary of War, and Washington both agreed that there were a lot of travesties that were occurring. And Washington hoped that settlers would respect native land. He also hoped that natives would take up Christianity and settled agriculture. Didn't get his wish. There's conflict, there's violence that occurs in the Northwest. Now, eventually, Anthony Wayne will take 3,500 men and defeat a coalition of Miami. Delaware and Shawnee forces. They'll have a battle, Battle of Fallen Timbers, in August 1794. Homes and crops were destroyed. British influence on the dominant tribes in the region all but ended. That's why we say the Treaty of Greenville will end native resistance, large scale resistance, specifically in. The Northwest. Now we do see during Washington's presidency, early in his term, the Treaty of Canandaigua signed between the United States government and the Six Nations. And this treaty is still in effect today. It's often viewed of as a thank you for the help that the Oneida gave the United States during the revolution, specifically when the Oneida showed up with bushels of corn to feed the troops. This was kind of payback for it. Traditionally, this treaty has come in the form of what are called annual annuity payments. Sometimes it would be in payments of goods or food or outright cash payments. The actual terms, the payments itself, those have changed over the years, but this treaty is still in effect. And it exemplifies the fact that moving forward, when the United States has negotiations with Native Americans, the federal government will deal with each nation and tribe separately. 